August 29, 2005, Hancock County, Mississippi, found itself in the path of Hurricane Katrina. In 2007, some volunteers went down to see how they were doing. And these are the stories of the people they met. While traveling around Hancock County, Mississippi, meeting and interviewing people about the recovery efforts, one name kept coming up. Conrad. And then the story of, the, of Conrad. Conrad is this amazing person. The day that I met Conrad. So I had met, uh, I'd met Conrad once before. Who is Conrad? Conrad is a contractor from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, who saw the footage of Hurricane Katrina and felt morally obligated to contribute to the cause. Conrad's been down here since just after the storm. He came, he was owned a construction company in South Carolina and felt led to come down here and do everything he could and worked with, he's worked with several different organizations he worked on his own building sheds to help the families just in the immediately aftermath, which turned into places for extra members of the family to live or for them to store articles of whatever they had. And then he jumped around from organization to organization just helping coordinate volunteers, train people. And then he, we were lucky enough to get him here and help us with when we were here, he was helping us build the facility and he was also out on home sites, building homes. Just basically came in, um, kind of saw it as a spiritual thing, gave up a very thri thriving business in Myrtle Beach, um, building huge houses, lots of them, um, and just basically took his savings and moved his family out and is now working on a stipend of like $100 a week. and organizing and, and, and horse trading and making it things work and running all these different sites and, and working with the, these um, folks that are homeless to get their houses rebuilt and working with the volunteers and, and just doing it because he felt like doing it. The day that I met Conrad, I, I didn't know him. I thought he was just a stock boy or stock person. He was doing something with cans. I was at the one-stop shop and I can remember saying, hi, hey, how you doing? And he was all busy, and he's like, and he nodded at me. And we had become friends, and then next thing I know, he was coming over on our property with volunteers, what they call, watch. I call them our friends, because these are our lifelong friends. How'd you find Conrad? How'd you? It was through Mike. In Camp Coastal. Okay. You know, Camp Coastal. Okay. Yeah. Plus, I had met, uh, I had met Conrad once before, like I think it's been about a year ago, I had went to him trying to get, you know, help trying to fix my house. So you got, and do you have a date that you think it's going to happen, or? You know, I didn't ask him. Um, I kind of just thought, you know. Yeah, you're just thankful that he's doing it. I right? just kind of watch and look, you know. Conrad is a very modest person who would rather direct the attention towards hurricane survivors, so we couldn't get him in front of the camera too much while we were down there. However, on the last day, sort of on a whim, he asked me if I'd like to travel around with him. As he drove through some small neighborhoods, he recalled some of the people and places he had encountered through his experiences in Hancock County. I mean, how could you afford to kind of just leave everything, your business? Actually, business-wise, I, I, I split my team up with uh, three different companies uh -huh. and, um, and they were people that used to work with me and, all, and then they learned enough and then and then started their own business mm -hmm. and all um, and so I was able to uh, keep them employed. Did any of them follow you here? One of them did. Mm. One of them did. If that was a smart aleck that said well <laughs> <laughs> you know you don't know if it's going to hit Mississippi, you don't know if it's going to be bad, and you're so cheap you won't buy new parts for your trucks. Mm -hmm. 
I said, you're right, but we're going we're gonna to go. And uh, uh, he said, well, uh, if you go, I'm, I'll go with you. He did come, and, and he was a, uh, an asset, a help, you know. It was hard for him to deal with all of uh, uh, the personal struggles and yeah. seeing everything. With so many people that were suffering, how did you decide who to help? It was more or less one of the, it, just on an individual basis mm -hmm. at all. You know, you have limited resources, you have limited funds, you have limited materials, you know. Uh, and just taking a look at the, the, the situation, and, uh, you know, from... We talked about it a little bit. You said that you kind of felt called to come here. Yeah, it was... Uh, you know, I seen the reports on TV and knew that it was going to be a huge storm. Yeah. And uh, familiar with Hugo. You couldn't eat or sleep or anything because you couldn't. Like, I couldn't think about work. Nothing. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, just because I knew that when the storm would hit me, you know, personal past experiences, you know, that it would be devastating and, and how many. One place he wanted to make sure we knew about was the Pearlington Recovery Center, known to the locals as Pearl Mart. There we spoke with Larry Randall, who explained the unique ways Pearl Mart has benefited the post-Katrina community. The library there is where, in the early beginning, locals used that as a shelter. There would be as many as 500. Uh, the Red Cross was here. Uh, doing work. The volunteers uh, shared the place. Uh, there was also a medical uh, team, uh, a group from uh, Texas brought nurses and doctors down and you know, to give assistance to the family. And doctors from all over would sign up for a month at a time. Within a week they started they set up the medical facility here. So oh. This is Larry. He was in People Magazine last month. Larry helps organize uh, this area here. He runs the, the Pearl Mart. Uh, helps coordinate the, the volunteer groups and keep the different groups that are down here working. It's a busy road. I went to Nassau, which is five miles north of us, and uh -huh. I've just been here ever since. I uh, come back in the next, next morning, they're, they're cracking down. And, it's been steady going every day, ever mm -hmm. since. It's all Bronx City County and the county school system, but they let us just do what I need to do to get rebuilt. Being they're not going to use it as ever use it as a school again, so they just kind of let me have that. We name it Pearl Mart, kind of like Walmart. We call it the Pearlington Recovery Center. What happened to the kids that were here? Where did they end they're up going? going? About 20 miles from here, uh, in the Teal Pacific. Uh, they set up a series mm -hmm. of double wide trailers. We're still housing volunteers in half out, and then we opened up this yeah. Boys and Girls Club and it, or something put on a summer program for mm -hmm. boys and girls. And now we're doing this afternoon school program. We're trying to get it started this week. This little building over here, I come through the Bush Clinton Foundation for our, our for our community library. Uh -huh. the library used to be in the building down here, but it's uh, still got to be renovated. So uh, they set up this trailer in here for a, a temporary on a three-year contract. 
the, the building has to be renovated. Right? Mm -hmm. so, so we got this mobile library donated. And we worked out of it for oh, about eight months, I guess. And then, like I said, we just opened up this new one. It's a public library. Our gym, we're pretty much using it for a warehouse. We've got food stored in it. You know, we're getting you know, food for the volunteers, and we're still delivering um, boxes and stuff like that to the elderly people, people that really need you know, help. And then, of course, we our storage for our supplies for helping rebuild these houses and stuff like that. And then we got Encore with the United Methodist working out there, Salvation Army, Red Cross, uh, train aid today, uh, the Lutherans, Lutheran mm -hmm. Church, and then just and all the Baptist churches and stuff like that. And but we try to work it all out of one office and stuff where there's not mass confusion everywhere. Just uh, everybody are doing their own thing. The way we, mm -hmm. we we all work together. Even though they they're doing their own projects, we try to work together on different things and provide mm -hmm. uh, assistance. And, mm -hmm. So you kind working. of head up the whole thing. Pretty or? much. Mm -hmm. Pretty much been doing it since the start. I'm from here, been here all my uh, life, or I'm mm -hmm. almost all my life. And, uh, I just I was supposed to be retired. It's just giving mm -hmm. my time. Yeah. yeah. I've been doing it for over two years now. <laughs> but it's working. As long as you get these people out, these FEMA trailers, these kids out of these FEMA trailers, that's 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 the major part. You know, with a watermark up on the backboard. Oh. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, how deep it got. Wow. It's all case managed. We don't just have walk-ins anymore. There for a long time, we was open it. We had our distribution open. Uh, for a while, it was seven days a week. And what we deliver now is all case managed stuff. It's kind of like a food bank. No walk-ins, just referrals. Uh, different organizations do donate stuff like like the furniture. All this, all of this, come in last week out of Iowa. Uh, mm -hmm. We see they're getting in their house and they need a little bit of furniture to help them get moved in and stuff like that. That we try to provide it. Uh -huh. Like washers and dryers and yeah. stoves. <coughs> water is a big issue here because everybody in the town, in our little town, is on well water. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of these wells got contaminated. Uh -huh. I mean, it's all right to wash clothes with or bathe with, but not to drink and cook with. So mm -hmm. we try to provide water. We get this some of the water from with different organizations. A lot of it still we get in the food camera. So how did you accumulate all of this stuff? Was it solely through yeah, volunteers or so donations? Through donations and volunteers. Wow. There were some things we buy, I mean, but not very little, you know. Mm -hmm. But I mean, we don't ever get any more. What we get now, now we might get a little bit of water. And the only reason we got that from FEMA, because FEMA can't store it no longer than a certain amount of time. Like I said, it's still good water. Okay. Uh, ultraviolet rays will change the properties in water. Like um. Whether it's through a bottle or whatever. As long as it's kept in a controlled environment, it, it lasts mm -hmm. a, a couple of years. Said you were pretty much ready to retire. What made you decide to stay here and Well, help? I was retired. Oh. I had a massive heart attack and was forced to retire oh. three years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, there's still a lot of stuff to be done. I mean, I know I can't do a lot of things physically. Mm -hmm. As far as the rest of it, I can't, you know. As far as directing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right after the storm, whenever FEMA was pulling out and the Red Cross was pulling out and Salvation Army was, but, I mean, they, they was wanting to shut all this down. Well, mm -hmm. I had still some of my best friends in tents, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. I told them, well, we appreciate it, appreciate the help. I said, but we ain't shutting nothing down. Uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. I know y'all tired and y'all ready to go home, but I'm I'm tired and I am home. You know? mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so we just, just me and a friend of mine out, kept the place up and going, and you know, we just help other people and stuff like that. Just and we've been up and running ever since. Mm -hmm. Nothing you can't, you know, it's, you, you always run across hurdles or or some stumbling blocks or just different things. You can move mountains. Mm -hmm. Or go around at once. We're all the time fighting other deadlines and different uh, codes and rules and regulations, and I try to keep up with all that because the homeowners don't know, and definitely the volunteers don't know yeah. the codes and rules and regulations, stuff like that. So I can take 10, probably 90% of all the meetings and one thing or another, and just in that I deal with that part out myself where they don't have to. I mean, their mm -hmm. hearts are just big around, but if you don't follow rules and regulations and guidelines, it, it, you know don't work. So, yeah. so there for years and years we didn't have the rules and regulations as far as the building codes. Mm -hmm. right? But now we do since the storm I mean uh, we didn't have no choice. We had to adopt the building codes. Mm -hmm.